We're going to continue uh, with our uh, uh, Praying Through the Tabernacle series. I hope you all enjoyed last week. And if you didn't, uh, I've, I've still got some things for it, but I, I've got some more things this week. And uh, I kind of extended on it. Matter of fact, I really got blessed. I, uh, the Bethel United Pentecostal Church has got a small prayer guideline for Praying Through the Tabernacle that I found. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and give you all that. Uh, and, and it'll be kind of jumping ahead, but it's kind of compacted. They don't have as much as I'm going to give you here, but it does give you a synopsis, basically, of certain things, and so I, I'm kind of glad for that, so I'm going to hand these out, and uh, with these handouts, I've also got a, um, well, I'll let you see them. I'm going to go over with you real quick, but uh, uh, let me hand this. I get some young folks around here, hand them out. I love that. You guys fly around here and hand them out. I'll figure out how to put them out there. I don't care. I've only got 20 of them because, well, uh, last time I was only able to give out 12 or 15. So I, I just assumed, I, I was hoping by faith I'd have five more to give out. Because <laughs> uh, I figured if I kept promoting it sooner or later, somebody would pick up on it. Amen. But we are certainly thankful for all of our visitors that are here tonight. Amen. Thank you for being here. Amen. We mean that wholeheartedly. Uh, it is a privilege, even to have you here with us tonight. Uh, I know it's good to see you back, and I apologize if I forgot to, but I know you've been here before, and I'm trying to remember your name again. Taylor. Taylor. Taylor, thank you for returning, amen, to the Lighthouse. We certainly appreciate having you here. Amen. And uh, now I know I'm going to get in trouble because I'm going to say names, and then I get myself in all kind of trouble. Well, thank God for visitor cards. Amen. It keeps me out of trouble that way. Amen. But, uh, and if I mess up your name, you just look at me and go, really? Come on, man. You can do better than that. Um, and I'm going to say, and, I, and if I do this, I'm, all, I'm going to apologize in advance, okay? Because I just got that feeling I'm going to mess it up. I'm trying not to, I promise. Is it? But that, is, I got this right, does it say Sinai Cruise? Did I say that right? Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Well, I just want to make sure it wasn't some kind of different spelling or dialect when I wasn't saying it incorrectly. And uh, Sandra Vasquez, is that correct? All right. Thank you guys for being here. Amen. We appreciate having you with us. Amen. Uh, we consider it a privilege for you to be here at the Lighthouse. Thank you so very much. We hope you enjoy your time here. Uh, we certainly, we're going to do everything in our power to make you feel at home. Amen. If we don't shake your hand or we don't come up to you and smile at you, if we put on a big old pickle face like this, you know, we look at you all weird like, and you come tell me, okay? And I'll make sure that individual uh, hears it from me at least, okay? Because uh, we, we make sure we try to smile and be friendly, all right? Amen. Because uh, the last thing I want to do is be around somebody that's a grouch. Can't stand grouches. Just can't deal with them. Amen. If you want to be a crab, have pinchers and walk sideways, that's up to you, you know? But uh, I, I'm not going to be a grouch. Praise God. Now, I had, now, on this handouts I had, this is the par- playing through the tabernacle pattern. Uh, and it goes through all the pieces of furniture in the tabernacle. I'm just going to give you a quick synopsis of it. Something, when you pray, you can use this as a prayer guideline. I want to thank the Bethel United Pentecostal Church for having this out there. Um, and I appreciate them so very much. So if they happen to hear that here tonight, amen. Thank you very much, Bethel United Pentecostal Church. Praise God. And so, uh, uh, but I also put on here, if you look on here, uh, the next page, this is just something I want you to keep and have. It shows you the furniture layout on the cross of Calvary. Amen. That the tabernacle plan from Moses was all pointing to this place called Calvary. Amen. And uh, you can see how the things are laid out there. Amen. How each thing represents something of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm not going to go over all that. That's not my purpose here today. But I just wanted you to have that in your hands. It's something to, uh, uh, that you may enjoy. Amen. Something that helps you to understand uh, a part of who Jesus was. And how he was literally that tabernacle laid out. And uh, the next page I'm showing you Moses' tabernacle in Exodus chapter 25. A read of this tabernacle and all the things that went to it. But I've got pointing directions here to the laver of washing. You see that? You see pointed there? i got these little arrows pointing to this thing called a laver. You see that? Page 3, I guess you want to say it as such. Page 3 is a laver of washing. Brother Chris, did you need one? Yes, sir, I do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're good. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, so that's what we're going to talk about tonight is that labor of washing. And I guess on page four, 
or the next page back. By the way, I appreciate my daughter putting these together for me tonight. She's not here to hear it, but all right, she's back in the back with Shell. Or this page four. I'm sorry, that was page four, wasn't it, for the uh, the labor of washing? I was on the wrong page. It was two pages for the front front page. So, um, and so uh, the labor of washing is actually on page four. I apologize. Yeah. And then page five, I'm going to give you a picture of the general idea of what they think that labor of washing was. We really don't know what it looked like. This labor of water or the labor of washing. They really don't know exactly what it looked like because God kept the, uh, the words about this thing. He kept it kind of skimpy. Amen. Uh, so it left some room for interpretation. Amen. Uh, of what it may have looked like. We don't know. We weren't there when they built it, so we have no idea what it looks like. Very much as we don't know what the world that then was before the deluge happened, we don't know what it looked like. Amen. We live in a post-diluvian world or a world that's been after the flood. Amen. But we only know what we see now. So uh, I want to start off with saying that uh, this labor of washing uh, was the place that they came to next. If you were here with us last week, the first place after we entered into his gates with thanksgiving and we came in, that's kind of how our prayer, prayer pattern begins as we enter his gates with thanksgiving. You come with a thankful attitude. That's what we talked about. You can't come in here being all uh, 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 negative and down and doubting everything. You just come in and be thankful because you know you're getting ready to talk to God. So it's an opportunity to be thankful before him and say, Lord, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that I can talk to you today. What an opportunity you give me for another day. So it's such a good opportunity that we have to bless the Lord. And we give thanks to Him. Because it puts us in the proper perspective, the proper attitude to come not only before God, but it helps us to receive something. Amen. You know, the hardest thing it is to tell somebody something when they're down in the, down in the mouth. You can't, they won't receive anything until they get out of their mully grubs. Amen. They, they just won't, they won't get, you can't tell anybody nothing when they're in their mood. Right? How many times your husband or wife or vice versa came to you in whatever situation was saying, well, I'll, I'll wait about 20 minutes from now when you calm down or when you feel better or you're, you know, you're not one of your, you know, or you've had a cup of coffee or whatever it takes. I don't know, but you know what I mean to, uh, to get you where you need to be. Right? And so that's why we call, tells us to come into his presence with praise and thanksgiving. I'm just synopsizing here. Bear with me for just a few moments. Amen. And then we come to that, uh, that, uh, uh, that golden or the brazen uh, altar, even also called the uh, altar of sacrifice. It was there, even that we ask God to, we try to die out to the things that we once knew in this life. It's a place of repentance. We're saying, not only I'm sorry, God, but I'm asked for things, some, some things to die in my life. Things that keep that I know I shouldn't be doing. Things that keep coming up. Amen. And I need them to die here. And that's we talked about that last week. Amen. And so and there are various other things about it. But like I said, I'm not here to go over that. We went over that last week. And so if you missed it, you just missed out. So I'm going to tell you. Amen. So we're going to move in, uh, on today into the labor of washing because it was the next piece. Now, if you look at that page four, if you would go to page four, I'm kind of glad I have a point of reference for this. It's kind of nice. If you look at that page four. You're going to see that both that altar of sacrifice, the big square, amen, and the little round circle, the altar labor of washing, the little round circle is what we're going to be talking about tonight, also called the labor of washing. If you'll notice, it's outside that box. You see the box? Amen. <clears throat> this is a diagram or an overview of Moses' tabernacle, what it would look like from a bird's eye view if I was looking down on it. Amen. This is what Moses' tabernacle would look like. You could not see all the curtains and hangings and stuff if you're standing directly over top of it. Uh, but this is what the general layout would look like. And so uh, we've already come to this brazen altar last week, and we've already come through the gates. Amen. And now we come to this place called the laver of washing or the washing laver, amen, or the, uh, the laver of water, as some people even call it. Either way, uh, this was a piece of furniture that was also outside the box, Okay. It was called the outer court. Amen. It wasn't the inner court. It was the outer court, and it was done by what we call natural light. Amen. In other words, sunshine was the only place that lit it. The only thing that lit this area was sunshine. Okay? And so, uh, uh, in the next place after that, the big box, amen, you'll see it sectioned off there, that big rectangle, was a place called the holy place. And in it was a table of shoe bread, that golden candlestick, and the altar of incense. If you look inside that box, 
We're not there yet. We're going to be there next week. Amen. But there, amen, was called the holy place. Amen. And it was given uh, artificial light through the candlestick was how it was lit. But then you get into the last place called the holiest of holies or the most holy place. It was where the Ark of the Covenant was. It's even a smaller box, actually a 10 by 10 square. And and it, it represented, amen, literally the presence of God with that Ark. Where there was no light at all. No light at all. You mean God has no light to him? I thought God is light. I thought God is love. I thought Jesus said he was the light of the world and all that kind of stuff. You mean it has no light? Are you kidding me? No, you got to remember, this is our way in. Amen. This is our way in. So we have to remember, amen, that when that curt was pulled back to brought you into that place, amen, light would come flooding into that place. Amen. Because the only way, folks, we can see heaven, because that's what it represented, it's a darkness to us. We've never been there. So as far as we're concerned, it's a dark place, even though the Bible tells us a place of light. The only way we ever really see into heaven is after we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost or being inside the holy place. Amen. And then we can get glimpses of heaven. We really get an idea what heaven may be like. And so little light gets pulled into the subject. Amen. We may not see it completely. We may not understand it completely. But, you know, when you learn to trust in God and you walk with God, it doesn't matter how dark it is. You don't need any light at all to trust Him. Amen. Come on, if you're like me, I... You know, I, 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 we were joking about this the other night in the Bible study. I was saying, me, I kind of like it dark around the house. You know, I'm one of these folks, I turn everything off and, you know what I mean, to get, keep it cool in the house. Not Michelle. Everything gets turned on in the whole house. I mean, it's a splendor. We don't blow every fuse on the, in the whole block. I mean, everything gets turned off. She goes, I don't understand you. Why do you like darkness so much? Because I'm a child of the light. And I tell her, I'm a child of the reality, honey. It's hot in here, and we need to turn these lights down so it'll cool the place off. Amen. I'm glad you're a child of the light, but amen. I said, when it comes time to sleep, I don't need all that light. Let's turn the lights off. Come on. Amen. Praise God. But we're going to talk about the labor of washing. It's very important we talk about that because I kind of wanted to bring that point out about the outside area or the uh, outer court, as it was called. The reason it was called that was because it literally was outside of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the holy place. So it was called the outer court. The inside place was called the inner court. So you got an inner and you got an outer, right? So, and it was lit with natural light. And see, it was very important that we remember these because they testify to three things about God in our life. Number one, we are justified by God, Okay? We are justified. What does justified mean? It means simply justified, never sinned. That takes place, folks, in the outer court. I didn't talk about that with the, uh, with the altar because you have to remember the altar and the labor of washing go together in this regard. You can't have one without the other. They have to have both for true justification. These folks who say you don't even need to be baptized, I don't understand them. Because I don't know where you, I, I don't, I just don't know where they see this in this tabernacle plan because it shows directly a labor of washing. Just for justification. Has nothing to do with even sanctification. Just justification because we move the next box over, the smaller box, even in the holy place, was the place of sanctification. We're sanctified by God's Spirit. And that final place is a place we're all looking forward to called the most holy place where we are going to be glorified or glorification. What that means is we're going to get this natural body changed to a what? Spiritual body. Amen. We're going to be transformed into his image. Amen. And we're going to begin to be as he is. That's the part we're waiting on. That's why we struggle now. And this is why we have to pray, folks, because we're not glorified yet. That means Christians have been serving God for 30, 40, and 50 years. They're not glorified yet, so they have the capability to sin. That's why we must pray. Praying is not just to get some kind of direction from God. Praying is also to get rid of sin in our life because, I hate to tell you this, we walk around in the world and we get dirty feet. 
You know, the Jews had a purification ritual that any time you walked in somebody's house, they kept a, uh, a big vase of water outside the household that you wash your feet off before you would go in. Why? Because where they lived at, it was all dusty and dirty. They didn't have Nikes. They had sandals. They had open-toed type shoes that they walked around in. And these sandals, leather straps, if you will, they would get dirty. And so when they come into somebody's house, they don't want to make a big dirty mess. So what they do is they wash their feet outside the door before they would go enter into. Okay? And so, uh, it, and it's a type of this labor. I won't get into that just yet, but just bear with me for a moment. But the whole idea, the reason why we have to go in prayer is because sometimes, <laughs> you know, as perfect as we are, we still fall short. Why is that? Well, even though God has justified me through the altar and through the labor of washing, even though He sanctified me by putting me in the holy place, I've not yet been glorified. That's why whosoever endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Amen. And so, with that being said, let's talk about the labor of washing, because we want to be sanctified here, but we also want to be justified. We want to be justified. And so, uh, to live in that process, to live in the justification process, uh, somebody asked me, why do I still sin? I said, because you're not glorified. You're still an earth creature, bottom line. You have the nature, even, of a sinner that is around you. Whether you like to admit or not, you spent a long time in this body. And this body was sinning long before you ever came to God. I said, it formed habits long before you ever came to God. I said, habits just don't walk away. Amen. You've got to teach it to have, to have a new nature. Amen. Praise God. You've got to be tra- transformed by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's why folks that just speak in tongues one time and never really seek after God anymore, you'll find that they struggle in their walk with God. Because we are renewed in the Holy Ghost. That's how we are renewed. That's what helps keep us transforming us. That's what helps change us from a, from a knucklehead to a not-so-knucklehead. Amen. It helps us get better as we go along. That's why it's important that we don't just seek God one time for the Holy Ghost. We continue to seek God to refill us with the Holy Ghost. To continually fill us up with His divine presence. And it helps us trans- be transformed. And I'm not here to give a lesson on Moses' tabernacle. Don't get me wrong. But I hate trying to lay a foundation for this labor of washing. Because we're in the outer court where we're talking about justification. This is the second part to the justification process was this thing called the labor of washing. The priests would come there. They were commanded after they left the altar that they were to wash in this labor of washing. It was made just like that altar of brass. Matter of fact, at the foot of this labor of washing, you will find that there were uh, mirrors at the bottom of it. Amen. There were little mirrors at the bottom of this thing that they would look at themselves and they would see the reflection of themselves, not in the water, but in the mirrors. The water was supposed to be troubled by them washing it. Amen. So the reflection, God wanted them to see the reflection in the mirrors. Amen. The reason he had the mirrors there is that what this does is a type of water baptism. I want you to understand this. The labor of washing, not only that, that's one of the types of his four, but it is a type of water baptism, being baptized in water, the washing, amen, that is to take place. Now, I know some folks will say, well, there's this scripture, there's that scripture, but no, we know that Peter said on Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent, that means you go to that big giant altar and you burn up some stuff. Amen. He said to be baptized, every one of you. He didn't leave anybody out. You notice that? He said, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Why? Because you are a reflection of the image and the glory of God, which is Christ Jesus. You all understand that? Amen. You are reflected in that. So you see yourself there. When you go to this water, it is a place for the remission of sins. Not forgiveness of sins, but remission. Our sins are forgiven at an altar. But they are remitted in the water. What is the difference, Brother D? Hold on. Bear with me. I told you, I'm not trying to give you a study on Moses' tabernacle. I'm, I'm trying to teach you how to pray through it. Just bear with me. We'll get there in a minute. Thank you, Yanni. Amen. But the way it works out, Amen. Is that, and I explain it a lot like this because I find this the easiest way. Visual things help me a lot with explaining things. Let's say Brother Smith, when he was a little fella, I'm going to blame you, Brother Smith. I'm going to get you in trouble. He came into his mom and dad's house and they had just bought brand new white carpeting. 
beautiful white carpeting. That's a no-no in everybody's house. Everybody knows that. But they did it anyway because they trusted their children not to make messes. And Brother Smith happened to come in with a Barks red cream soda. And drinking that cream soda, and of course, you know what happened. Yep, he spilled it on that nice white carpet. And of course, he was scared. He didn't know what to do. He couldn't get the stain out. It was there. What do we do? What do we do? Mom and Dad come home, and he finally just fesses up. Mom, Dad... I spilt red cream soda on this beautiful white carpet. And, of course, mom and dad are upset, as they will be. They're going to be angry. Well, some of them are. Maybe some parents don't get that way, but mine would have. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Not personal, mom. Amen. You mean I just bought this brand new white carpet, and you've already poured red cream soda on it? And all of a sudden, <laughs> see, you already got excuses. And Smith, all of a sudden, Brother Smith says, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean it, I really just did. And of course, when your child cries, you relinquish. And of course, the anger passes, say, oh, that's okay, son, I forgive you. But there's still a problem, isn't there? Anybody know what that problem is? There's a big old stain still in the carpet. There's a, see, there's a difference between forgiveness and remission. Remission of sin is... Somebody comes down with a scrub brush and I love my carpet or whatever that stuff is and squishes it all over the carpet and stain master plus or whatever and they get this stain up to where it looks new again. And see, that's what the labor of washing does for us. See, a lot of folks think that when they think forgiveness, they think everything's just done. No. Forgiveness relays the wrath. Remission removes and replaces and renews the situation, okay? That's what remission of sins does. You see, if you live in forgiveness, and that's why it's important when we pray, amen, we start talking about that labor of washing now. Okay? Amen. The Bible calls it, you ever heard the song, cast into the sea of forgetfulness? See, how terrible at this. Amen. The sea of forgetfulness, right? Where is that in the Scripture? I've never read it. Never have read it. Amen. But it does say in Micah chapter 7, verse 19. Would you find that for me, brother? I'd appreciate it. Micah chapter 7, verse 19. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And that will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. That's where they get that from. Okay? So, but the idea was... The sin was being thrown in the sea, much like it was in the book of Exodus when they ran out of Egypt. They left Egypt, which is a type of forgiveness. I'm walking away from Egypt. It's a type of repentance. Amen. And then they go through the Red Sea, right? Even It's a type of the labor of washing, going through the Red Sea. But what happened when Pharaoh's army tried to go and get them? They were covered over by the water, and they were whelmed over. Amen. So their sins were covered. You all see? So the concept is still the same. Amen. So the idea was that the, the labor was a place of cleansing, but it was also a place, amen, of remission of sins. Praise God. Um, let, me, let, me, let me say this. He said they, they were supposed to wash their hands and their feet there. And guess what the command was? So that you die not. Think about that. That's some strong words. You wash or you die. Right? You wash or you die. What are you talking about? Well, I remember a fellow by the name of Peter. Jesus said to him, Peter, <laughs> if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. What was he talking about? Pete, you're going to walk through this life and your feet are going to get dirty walking around amongst, the, amongst us and you're not going to be perfect all the time. Therefore, if I don't wash you, you can't live. Then Peter got smart. Well, do my head, do my feet, do my eyes, do my arm, you know. Right. Why? Because God's got a cure for dirty feet. It wasn't just about his feet. It's the, where we're going, things we're doing, things we're saying, right? And so he said with that, even that's what this labor of washing was all about. When we come and we pray and we ask God not only to forgive us, but Lord, I know you cleanse me from all sin. Lord, I know 
that I must that I have done things and that, that I'm going to walk and, I, and I'm not saying this is one who's just now coming to to being baptized, but one who's already been baptized in Jesus' name because that's my mirror. Thank you, but I won't get into that. Something else, amen. But the concept is that Lord, I have the capability to not do things right all the time. Don't just forgive me. Let's remove it out of here. Let's wash me clean. Cleanse me, O oh Lord. Cleanse me. You know, there's nothing more cleansing than a bath. You ever notice that? A shower, should I say. When you get covered over by water, there's nothing more. There's not a cleaner feeling in the world than when you step out of the shower. You know, I used to, I, I used to love it when the babies were small. You know, they're little bitty, bitty babies. Because when you see like after you bathed them and you gave them a bath and you brought them out and you put all the stuff on them and you squished them over with all the stuff, you, they were like shiny and brand new, didn't, weren't they? Like you, they could just squeaky clean, you know what I mean? And of course, they'd run around. You know, but I mean, you know what I mean? They're like squeaky, squeaky clean. And so what we're looking for is that this thing will cleanse us. Mark 16 and 60 said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Amen. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Why does he think he says that? Because what's the point of getting baptized if you don't believe? Makes sense, doesn't it? But if you believe and you get baptized, then he says you'll be saved. Roman, give me Romans 6 and 4. So this is not just about baptism. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm going to, I'm just trying to lay the point of baptism down. Okay? Romans 6 and 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, and so we also should walk in the newness of life. Baptism, it says, saves us. Why? Because we wash that we what? Die not. That we die not. Amen. Now, I thought it was really interesting. They don't... I don't know how they knew how big to make it, because he doesn't give a size for how big it's supposed to be made. Not Moses' tabernacle. There are no dimensions. They had to figure it out on their own. You know what that means? That means there's an endless supply of water, no matter who it is. That's why Peter said, repent and be baptized. It ain't just for the Jews. It ain't just for a certain set of people. There's only so much water to go around here, folks. No, no. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Everyone. Why? Because it's unlimited water here we're talking about. The earth is covered, three quarters of the earth is covered in water. That should tell us something. Amen. So, part of this thing, amen, is that we are washed and sanctified. Give me 1 Corinthians 6 and 11. I'm not, I'm not here just to do that, but... And, and uh, I'm going to do a couple more scriptures on this, and I'm going to shut up about baptism, okay? But I think it's important that we understand this. It says, such were some of you, amen, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. He said, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Justification did not take place in the holy place. It took place in the outer court. How to say we were justified? In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus Christ. What's that tell us? Well, where am I justified? Where would I use Jesus' name to be justified at? <laughs> at the labor of washing. It is the place where the name of the Lord is called over you. Amen. And so he wasn't talking about being sanctified there, but being justified there. He said the sanctification came by the Holy Ghost. Amen. So uh, it's another part to it. Amen. And then finally, uh, give me uh, 1 Peter 3, chapter 21. I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. And we'll, we'll stop there with the, the baptismal references. I just wanted to give all these references there because I don't think we realize uh, the amount of baptismal references that there are for this. Amen. The like figure whereof the even baptism doth now also save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Think about that. So we know the labor of washing was for baptism, really. Amen. That's what part of what it was mainly about. But, folks, amen, the priests had to wash the blood off in that water. They had to wash their hands and they had to wash their feet. That's why when we pray, we're praying, Lord, I give you glory, I give you honor, I give you praise, all these things. But, 
Lord, I want you to wash me clean. Lord, renew in me a right spirit. Create in me a clean heart, he said. Amen. Because there's a work that has to be done here today. Amen. And what he say? It's an answer to a good conscience toward God. Why is that? Create in me a clean heart. Okay? What does that mean? Well, that means if I, before I could ever receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, amen, i can, I got to lay aside every bit of this world. Before I can get spiritual, you know, John, before he ever received a revelation from God, he said, was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. You cannot receive revelation until you're in the Spirit. You can't do it. You can't do it outside of that because you have natural light you're dealing with. Only when you got God's great light, amen, do you receive revelation. That's why when we pray and we're at the labor of washing and we're praying through it, we come next to this labor of washing, we're saying, Lord, you need to wash me from head to toe. Wash my thoughts. Wash the things in my life. You know, and that's where we start with our hands and our feet, he said. Why? Hands are the things that we're doing, right? Lord, I, <laughs> these filthy hands of mine, man, I, I probably, I, I know I sh- shouldn't have spoke that. I shouldn't have done this. Amen. The things I did with these hands, I should have known better than the things that I'm doing. I, maybe I should have thought about how I spoke to that person better. Maybe I could, you know, maybe I could be doing more than what I'm doing. Lord, you know, there's sins of commission and sins of omission, folks. Amen. And things you do and some things you know you should be doing that you don't do. Amen. And so, you know, we're praying these things uh, about things that our hands are doing. Things that they're, uh, things that we know about. And I, and I try not to try to bring up every little thing in the book here. Amen. But we know what we're doing when we're doing them. Amen. And so, and the more you pray, the more it's going to come up for you, to be honest with you. But it's the things that we're doing with these hands. Amen. Lord, I, I know that you can cleanse me. Lord, I know that you can wash me. I know that you can pour that water through me and, amen, and, and remove everything from me and, and have confidence that when, and here's, let me, let me tell you what it's also about. That when we come to the labor wash, we have confidence that our sins have been removed. Do you understand that? You need to have confidence that because you can't walk into the holy place, amen, with dirty hands. You gotta be confident that God is hearing you. And that you're hearing from God. Because the Bible said there are many voices in this world. And so you've got to distinguish what's God's voice. How many times has someone killed somebody and said, well, God told me to do it? you kidding me. What kind of voice are you listening to? That's why we have to have our heart cleansed and we have to be clean in our thoughts. Clean our, cleanse my thoughts. Lord, I, you know, uh, as a man, I know what we deal with as a man. We have our own set of problems that we deal with as men. Just as much as you ladies have your own set of problems you deal with being female. Okay? I don't have certain female problems. I, in fact, some of these things Michelle has things that drive her crazy don't seem to affect me whatsoever. I'll be honest with you. I'm like, why is that bothering you for? But there are things that drive me nuts that don't seem to, don't, don't seem to, you know, it doesn't seem to do much for her. Like, why is that bothering you? You know? Lord, help me not to doubt. Cleanse my thought process in here, Lord. Help me not, because men are great doubters. I don't know if you know that or not. Amen. So we have great wrath and we have great doubt. That's what the Bible tells us. We're doubting Thomas is big time. All of us men are. We doubt everything. Amen. Amen. You ladies have more faith in us by general rule. You just do. Amen. Amen. You really do. We doubt. We analyze things to death. I mean, I'm well, I got mad the other day. I was at Cracker Barrel. I couldn't defeat that thing for nothing. You know the thing with the golf tees? I must have been, what they call me, ignorant four or five times or whatever it was because I couldn't get past. And I thought, how, could, what, how hard can this be? And the kids get on there, flip. They ain't got no rhyme or reason to it. They're just... And they got two left. And I'm trying to do a mathematic equation about everything. I'm pulling this over here. And I'm like, well, if I do this back here, I have to be able to jump this. I'm trying to think three moves ahead. (laughs) But my point is simply this, folks. We need to have confidence in God. And the way we have confidence is that we know there is no condemnation in us. You know the reason the devil keeps you down sometimes is because he condemns you and you feel condemned. When you're praying, you cannot feel condemned. I don't care if you've had the worst day in the world and you've done stuff you're embarrassed in front of God for. You come because you've been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, you know what, Lord? You don't see me. You see the blood of Jesus here. 
And I'm applying that blood again to my life. Lord, one more time, wash me again. And you can have confidence then because, listen, if you don't, the devil's going to sit there and yell at you. What are you doing trying to go before God here today? You know what kind of day you've had? You better go when you're more spiritual. Right? That's why that labor of washing, what it does for us, amen, we, that doesn't mean we jump in the water and get baptized again. What that simply means is that when we go and pray and we're standing by the labor of washing as we go through this tabernacle plan, we can honestly say in our heart, Lord, wash me fresh. Wash me anew. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my mind. Cleanse my thoughts. Lord, I'm thinking about stuff I shouldn't be thinking about. You know, cleanse my mind. Begin to work on my mind process, Lord. Help me not to be condemned in my thoughts, in my thinking processes. You know, <coughs> excuse me. But well, those are the things, amen, that God wants us to do. Amen, that labor of washing. But not only that, but there's also where our feet trod. He said, listen, we want you to wash their feet too. Wash your feet. Why would you wash your feet? Why? Because we've got to be careful where we're going. Where we're walking to. You know, sometimes the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the ways thereof are the ways of wickedness and death. We think we're, we think we're doing the right thing. We're walking towards something because we think we know what we're doing. Can I tell you that labor of washing will help you to walk right? Amen? How many times people say, I've stumbled in my walk with God. I, you know, I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with that. Well, have you asked God to help you? I mean, really help you? Or are you just going by what you already know? Here's where it's dangerous. Folks have been serving God for a long time. They know there are certain patterns that seem like churches go through. And they get stuck in that pattern sometimes. And if they're not careful, and we're not careful, we'll find ourselves falling into a church pattern and not the will of God. I'm going to say that again. Well, I don't know why we're trying to grow. We're only going to get to a certain mountain that's going to split anyway. I rebuke you, by the way. In Jesus' name. Because if folks are going by the labor of washing, there won't be no splits. Problem is we can't get nobody by the labor of washing. Come on. We can do a five-minute courtesy drop. Thank you, Jesus. Move along now. But when you spend time at that labor of washing, Lord, watch where these feet go because the devil's going to try to tell me to go a different direction. The devil's going to try to work on me and he's going to try to, he's going to, try to tell me I'm not in the will of God. He's going to try to tell Man, that's when you've got to set your feet by the altar and say, you know what, I ain't moving anywhere, God, until you give me marching orders. And that labor of washing will do it for you. Amen. Because it will cleanse your feet. It will give you direction, a renewed place of direction to go. And God will give you marching orders. You know, a lot of people think that you can't get marching orders until you get told of the Holy Ghost. Just the opposite is true. You can't get marching orders until you get to the labor of washing. That's where your feet are washed. Amen. They're anointed when you get into the labor, to the, the most holy place, but, or the holy place. But they'll, they'll give you direction right there. That's why I try to tell people all the time, I said, you know, they, they ask me things like, well, I'm just coming to God. What, you know, what, what, what if I get hit by a bus? You ever heard of these before? What if I get hit? I tell him, I say, you're not going to get hit by a bus. Because what God starts in you, He said He'll also finish in you. He's not a liar. I said, never matter of fact, you want to know the truth? You're never more secure in this life than when you make a start for God. I said, three times a year, he said that all the males were to appear before the Lord in the Old Testament. He told them, you don't worry about your land. You don't worry about any thieves coming along. You don't worry about your crops. You don't worry about locusts. You don't worry about anything touching your land. Because when you come before me, I'll take care of that stuff. The one time you don't have to have guards, the one time you don't have to have anything, is the one time you're appearing before God. Amen? Praise God. And that's what it is. But we get to that labor of washing. We can say, Lord, <laughs> I'm yours. You're mine. Wash me. Cleanse me so that my feet get right so I can set my feet and go the right direction. Amen. You see, the enemy likes to fight you over certain things, especially. One of those places is that labor of washing. What do you think baptism is such a big deal for? Huh? Why, why do you think the enemy fights over baptism? Because he knows you're heading in the right direction. 
I'm going to say it like this. Amen. If he can get you off in the wrong direction, <laughs> amen, he knows you'll never find the place of sanctification. You know how many people have, have intellectualized themselves to death? They're so smart, but they're ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Got more degrees than a thermometer, but dumb as rocks. Because some of the most basic concepts of Scripture. Amen. Because, you know, this thing cannot be walked in natural flesh. You can't do it. You can't do it. This thing only comes, amen, praise God, but by the Spirit of God. You know, this labor also was made out of bronze and um, lets us know that also it had no staves, amen. It had nothing that was carried. We don't know how it was supposed to be carried. There's no way, there's no Bible that says this is how it's carried, didn't have staves that we picked up. You know, some things had long rods. You picked them up and the priests carried them on their shoulders. You know what that tells me? That this baptism, listen, anybody can preach baptism in Jesus' name. You see, sometimes we think we're the only ones got staves in our hands. And only the UPC is going to heaven. I want to tell you something. I, I, I'm going to be honest with that. Now, if I, if I hurt your theology, I'm sorry, okay? No, I'm not. But when I'm talking to people about going to heaven, you know what I tell them? I am not God said to sit there and tell you who's going to heaven. I don't sit there. Uh, he said he'll be merciful to whom he'll be merciful. Period. I said, but what I do know is this. Here's what I can teach you for what I believe the Word of God says and what we believe here. We believe that you are to repent of your sins, be water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, even, and you'll receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You'll be evidence of that by speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. And there's Bible for that too. Hang on. I said we're to walk holy before God because we're supposed to live in that holy place. Amen. Until that one day when we can finally press through that final veil, Amen. I know Jesus has torn that veil away. Don't get me wrong. Amen. But we're still not allowed to enter into heaven until he says go. Amen. We're not there yet. I don't care what anybody says. We're not there yet. Last time I checked, I know I ain't. I, sorry. <laughs> Amen. So what I'm trying to tell you is this labor of washing was such an imperative mental piece because it had no staves. Anybody can preach it. Anybody. If they're preaching baptism in Jesus' name, they're setting their feet right. You hear me? It's not just designed for the ALJC or the UPC. It could be any mom and pop little store somewhere, storefront out there that's preaching. To, so, you know, we, we don't have the market cornered on this. And what he was simply saying is they could be preaching it down in Jamaica. They could be preaching it in Puerto Rico. They could be preaching it in churches here, churches there. It doesn't matter. Amen. All can be saved. <coughs> And that's why when I pray, I say, Lord, I don't care who's carrying this thing. When I get to that labor wash, I say, Lord, let it start in China. Let it start in South Korea. Let it start in North... It don't have to be one of our missionaries, but if it's one of our missionaries, that's just fine too. But as far as I'm concerned, find somebody, let them preach it. Amen? Because it don't have to come, it don't have to come out of my smokestack, Brother Smith. Amen. He taught me that years ago. Says some folks think if you don't come out of a smokestack, it ain't smoke. <laughs> Praise God. You didn't think I remember that, did you? <laughs> Let me tell you what it was also for. It was only for the priests. What's that mean? Well, the Bible said you are a royal priesthood, a called out and a chosen generation, right? We minister, folks. We are ministering. Do you realize that when you repent of your sins, you get water baptized, you are ministering, believe it or not. First, you're ministering to yourself, but then you get to minister to others. But you're in a position of ministry. That's why it's such a holy thing. That's why when we come to that labor of washing, you've got to remind yourself, Lord, I'm in a priesthood here. I've got to act like one. Listen. My mindset's got to be holy before I can walk into the holy place. In other words, I got to be—I may not be holy just yet because His Spirit has to dwell with me. But that don't mean I can't think about holiness. That don't mean I can't completely understand holiness. It simply means, Amen. 
Because when you're washed, listen, I want to tell you something. I've seen folks who have been baptized. Amen. Most morally strong people you ever meet in your life. I mean, they don't drink, don't smoke, goody two shoes. I mean, I'm telling you what, they won't, they, they, uh, they, they won't look at a bad TV program. They won't look at, the, they won't look at, you know, I mean, just morally strong folks. Hmm. But they're going to bottleneck at the door. The bottom line is this, is that when we're by that labor of washing, amen, when we're by that labor of washing, what we're doing, not only are we asking God to forgive us of our sins, the importance of baptism in our life, the cleansing, the renewing, the washing, amen, but it's also a place where we're saying, God, send others to receive this. Let this thing get so big. Let this, I, it's limited, unlimited. This is for everybody, Lord. Amen, Lord. I, you know, I, I know a lot of people don't think this is a place of intercession, but technically it really is. It's a place of See, a lot of folks don't believe you can intercede until you get to the holy place. Because the Holy Ghost intercedes for us. It says, no, the Holy Ghost intercedes for us. That don't mean we can't intercede for somebody else before we get there. So that's why it's important that we wash at this labor. It's more than just a baptism. It's more than just washing your hands and washing your feet. But it's saying, you know what? Lord, let this thing go everywhere. Let more people receive this. Let more people get a hold of this. Let more people understand, amen, that you're the one that went on the cross at Calvary, and it's you that died on the cross. Amen, that I'm being buried with you in water baptism. Amen, that when I look at that mirror, amen, I'm seeing the glory and the image of God in Jesus Christ. Because you were made... In the image of God. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to sh- close here in just a minute. But it's important to remember, this thing was made of brass. You know, brass was a, a metal for warfare. I think I told you that before. And it seems like one of the places we have to war all the time is when there comes this baptism. You're going to have to fight for it. You go, there's times it's going to say, no, uh, you don't have to be baptized in Jesus' name. Under the authority of. That's what that means. Quit dancing around this thing. You pray in Jesus' name, I hear you do it. You pray for healing in Jesus' name. When it comes time to baptize somebody, all of a sudden it has to. Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. What's wrong with you folks? He's got a name. His name's Jesus. Amen. A little history lesson for you. Amen. Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name. What's the name of the Father's come in? Jesus. Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary. You shall have a son. You shall call his name Jesus. The angel said that actually to Mary. You shall have a son. You shall call his name Jesus. Jesus, amen. They said, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, he said, whom the Father will send in my name. What's that name? Jesus. You know what amazes me? Why people are so afraid of the name of Jesus. That's why when I get to that labor of washing, I throw that name up there all over the place. Lord Jesus, help me. Lord Jesus, cleanse me. Lord Jesus, wash me. Lord Jesus, I need... Amen. Because I'm not confused when I pray. What a confusing mess that will be when you get down to pray. Am I praying to the Father tonight, the Son, or the Holy Ghost? It's not funny, really. It's not. It's sad. It's sad. It's confusion. God's not the author of confusion. When everything's wrapped up in Jesus Christ, you've got it all in Him. That's why it's imperative when we come to that labor of washing, you bring His name up. You bring His name up all over the place. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. You know, I don't know if somebody got a revelation of this or not, and I'm going to shut down here right now. But you know, they said to me, they said, you know how I get people to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost? I said, what's that? He said, well, I get them to pray. He said, and of course, you know, I'm not here to do an altar seminar here, but he said, you know, we, of course, we have them repent. We have them open their mouth. We have them, you know, repent of their sins. And 
uh, be in a constant state of repentance and whatnot, and we have them begin to praise and worship, if we can get them to praise and worship, that is sometimes. We take the gum out of their mouth. Right? And, and, and we have them lift their hands, and we tell them, here's what I want you to say. I want you to start just by saying the name of Jesus and just keep saying that for a while. He said, it's amazing how things just start flowing out of that. He said, they might not receive the Holy Ghost right away. He said, but all of a sudden, they'll just say, and all of a sudden, they'll start saying things on their own. He said, because there's something powerful when you start bringing up Jesus. You start bringing up Jesus. You start bringing up Jesus. Amen. He said, you know what I believe? He said, I believe Jesus prepares you to enter into the holy place. I'm a firm believer, and I believe you're right. Amen. Let's all stand. Ask the Lord to cleanse you from all your sins and weaknesses through the blood of Jesus by His Word. Determine in your heart to live a life that's holy and acceptable to God. Claim victory over the works of the flesh. Amen. Get direction from God at that brazen labor. So you cleanse yourself from the works of the flesh by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Cleanse their hearts from guilt before approaching God. There's a scripture that talks about the washing of regeneration in the New Testament. That word washing there is a Greek word for lave, or for the labor of washing. It talks about the water baptism. Now, I'm not here to preach baptism of regeneration. I don't believe in that. Amen. But what I do believe is this. Amen. That the labor of washing remits our sins. And it's there that not only are we forgiven at that altar, we say, Lord, I have no condemnation when I leave here. I can walk into that holy place, and the Holy Ghost can move in my life. And when I get to this altar, I can really intercede. Amen. I can really get to the place here where you're doing things, Lord. You're helping me. Sometimes we hit a ceiling. We don't pray like we need to, and we have a strong time. It's like we can't get past. It's probably because we're living in condemnation and don't even realize it. We know we're doing things we ought not have. We're our spirit ain't right. We're living in anger, mad at somebody about something, or frustrated because our job's not going right, or whatever it may be. Humans are such weird creatures. Amen. We are very complex. That's why you've got to have mercy. Because I guarantee you, what you're complaining about that day, you'll be going through next week. What you see somebody else doing that week and you're mad at them for it, watch out because it's coming to you two weeks later. You'll deal with that same situation. I'd like us all, if we would, just to, amen, to come down to an altar and pray. Continue in this journey through this tabernacle, knowing what you know now between the giant altar and the great altar and the labor of washing. Let's at least begin there. Let's let the Lord lead us through that point. To ask Him to cleanse us. Let's come away from this thing with no condemnation. No condemnation. Come on. Remove that sin. Remove those feelings of doubt. Remove those places of anger and aggression. Let mercy reign.